So I went out today with my meter wheel to do some uh, fact checking and collect some data. I've been told that the highest density neighborhoods per capita are these sorts of medium density things. So uh, let's check that out. When you talk about density, there's a lot of factors, but if I'm gonna pick one, I typically use the shorthand of height. Obviously, height is easier to gauge than lot coverage, say, or building form. And I mean, I think it's a lot more fun. And it's always seemed to me that when buildings are tall, they tend to use up the lot that they sit on. You know, there's not a lot of backyards in downtown. A neighborhood of 50-story buildings is denser than a neighborhood of 10-story buildings, which is denser than a neighborhood of two-story buildings. It all seems pretty obvious, but many people say that it's not true. So what is their reasoning? Well, sometimes you'll hear that tall buildings have a diminishing amount of actual habitable space as they increase in height. Space ends up being almost entirely taken up by elevators and structural engineering so that they can reach those lofty heights. Kind of like the incredibly thick walls of medieval architecture. Sometimes you'll hear about streets around them needing to be so wide that it negates the height as well. Over the years, I've heard this, well actually, height is a deception line so many times. I have heard the highest density is everything from 3 to 20 stories. You don't even need to go above 10 floors. So I wanted to know, is it true? Are high rises not actually high density? What if I told you that? It's not what you said it is. So in the skyscraper corner, downtown in Montreal, is Square Phillips. It's a 200 meter skyscraper, which is the maximum height allowed, and it's being built on a former 7,420 square meter car park. So let's compare this to a nice, nearby, medium density neighborhood. Now I personally prefer this density. It's bang on the middle of medium. No elevators, external stairs, often built right up to the footpath, on an emotional level, I enjoy being in this neighborhood. It's a nice place to be. It's near where I live. I choose to live in this sort of a neighborhood. So I went and clicked out a 7,420 square meter block. So 150 meters down this length to see how many units we would get in the medium density neighborhood. So that gives us just over 130 units. I mean, there's some commercial units in there. So 130 units for 7,420 square meters if you're using medium density. On that same land area downtown, the skyscraper delivers 498 units for sale and 298 purpose-built rental units. So, 796 units. Boom! Well, actually, suck my balls, commenters. But, hang on, not all units are the same. Theoretically, one square Phillips could be hallways of micro-apartments squeezed in around elevator shafts and pipes of champagne being pumped up to the far-known penthouse. So I did the painstaking task of going through the plans for this tower, floor by floor, counting units, bedrooms, and unused space in the building. Then I went through the neighborhood with medium density buildings using government GIS data and knocking on doors to check the average floor plans. Fuck, it took me ages to well actually back at the well actuallys. At one square Phillips, there was indeed a fair amount of space in the center of each floor holding elevators and infrastructure. But if you look at the walk-ups, a lot of the setbacks in front of the buildings are holding stairways. The plexes also usually sacrifice interior floor space for stairs that go up to the third floor unit. Square Phillips has the ground, 21st and 50th floor dedicated to non-residential uses by the looks of things. But where Square Phillips has amenities like a pool and a lobby and a gym, the medium density neighborhood has backyards and a really nice back alley. So what delivers the highest residential floor area for the land? This 7,420 square meter block of land in the medium density neighborhood gave 12,852 square meters of residential space over three floors. On that same amount of land, Square Phillips provided 50,282 square meters of residential floor space. And there's something I haven't even mentioned yet. The development is adding another 21 story, 324 unit building on the same site. And although I can't get floor plans yet, if we extrapolate from a previous building, that's another 18,300 square meters of floor space. So a total downtown of more like 68,000 square meters. 
So for the medium density buildings here to provide an equivalent residential floor area, they would need to be at least five times taller. And of course at that height, they would require their own elevators and machine rooms and basement parking, etc. In fact, they would probably look a lot like this. This is Dolphin Cellar Park at 28 floors with 417 units. It's a big residential tower. This whole neighborhood has a pretty high population density for Canada, but when you break the census down to the block by block level, the densest blocks in the area time and time again are the blocks that are lined with high rises. And the densest of the densest happens to be the block with the highest of the high. So at what height do we stop being able to get this extra floor area? The truth is, we don't know yet. One article I found looked at the space efficiency of super tall buildings, which are about three times the height of Square Phillips, and several were still hitting 80% space utilization, which is a solid ratio at any height. Australia 108, for example, has 115,920 meters of usable space on a lot that is actually significantly smaller than Square Phillips. So what explains this fairly common belief amongst urbanist types that a high-rise building does not actually mean high density? Well, first of all, there are some crazy outliers in the world. Some buildings are built to be tall and touristy, you know? The CN Tower or the Burj Khalifa don't have high population densities. Some buildings are made for billionaires. They're basically sky mansions. Although they have very high floor areas, they have a relatively low population density. That same effect occurs in commercial areas. People point to some glass-towered section of Manhattan and say, you know, that area has a lower population density per square kilometer than some place that I like. There are lots of places in the world where you can pull this sort of trick. Transport networks traditionally radiate from downtown, you know, equidistant from most workers. And therefore, if you're placing an office, that's where it's traditionally gonna go. Rich people, well, they take up a lot of space if it's in Beverly Hills or on Billionaire's Row. But even in a skyscraper, there's still so many more of them per square kilometer than when they're in their typical detached single family mansions. So it means that a lot of famous skylines don't actually have a very high population density, but if those were normal residential buildings, they absolutely would. What they're doing is like pointing at a radio mast and being like, see, people don't live in tall structures. That's right, people don't live in offices. Good job. Is your mom around? The other argument you sometimes get is people pointing to an unusually dense neighborhood that is basically not viable in a modern city. The highest density neighborhoods in the world are slums. You know, people occupy very small units and cramped conditions. The other sort of dense, low-rise neighborhood is this sort of grandfather density. It's what you see in historic European centers. I mean, I covered all of this in a different video if you really want to know more, but here's the summary. Slums do have very high population densities for the heights of the buildings. But people in, say, Melbourne are not prepared to live in a unit like the ones in Karachi and would instead take a long commute to wherever to get some space. But to a lesser extent, the same thing actually happens with Paris. If a modern building has no elevators, common laundry, micro kitchens, small rooms, and no parking, it doesn't come across as quaint. Attempts at building like this actually do happen every once in a while, and they often don't go very well. People call the developer a slumlord and label it a shoebox apartment. And then they try to legislate that you can't build it like that anymore. <laughs> but you can often find an example of this sort of density in your own city, even if you don't have slums or historic high density housing. The highest density blocks in Montreal are actually just along here on this street. And uh, you can probably guess why. This is Concordia University. You can have a bunch of people in one apartment, shared kitchens, shared bathrooms. You can get the density way up without building super tall. But turns out people don't want to live like that for their whole life. The real problem people have with skyscrapers is that a lot of people just don't like them. The modern urbanist movement is an uncomfortable marriage between a few groups of people and one of them are the lefty environmental ecology community folks. The cold and personal nature of many contemporary glass skyscrapers, their association with the office and the rat race and finance workers, the lack of visible green space and, and community stuff, they just don't like it. And if someone comes along and tells them that it doesn't achieve its number one supposed big advantage, 
Well, that's something that they're very receptive to hearing. And people hearing what they want to hear, that might be the biggest issue that our society is grappling with. Now, there are issues with skyscrapers. Plenty. The architectural trends for skyscrapers have been needlessly energy inefficient until recently, but that is all just a regulatory change away from being fixed. And we're finally seeing the return of energy efficient non-glass skyscrapers. Yes, because I have had enough of glass for the rest of my life. So if you don't like inefficient skyscrapers, let's ban inefficient skyscrapers, but not all skyscrapers. That's like banning hydroponics because some people grow weed. And when you apply energy efficiency reforms, it supercharges skyscrapers for achieving climate goals. Because even a glass skyscraper is still far better than a car dependent suburb alternative that so many people often live in. Residential skyscrapers are also a boon to public transit infrastructure. They pump tons of money into municipal government for a minimal cost. They are a product of high land values and cost more to build per square meter, so many of them have expensive units. But they make your city cheaper. That doctor living in a condo downtown is one less person trying to buy a unit in your neighborhood. Empirical research from Finland, who are really on the ball when it comes to housing, shows that for each 100 new centrally located market rate units, roughly 60 units are created in the bottom half of the neighborhood income distribution through vacancies. If the fact that it frees up affordable housing isn't enough for you, many condo towers are also full of starter homes themselves. Sure, the penthouse on the top floor is in all the promotional materials, but everyone keeps shitting on these buildings based on their advertising. Looks rich, looks fancy. Reddit, Facebook groups, count windows at night, man. The lower floors of condo buildings often have places that are the first rung of a property ladder for people, where people can live car free, near work or school and save some cash. Condos are on average cheaper than equivalent homes in the same area. And when it comes to the whole foreign buyers, vacant condos bullshit, unlike a plex or a detached single family home, which you can get a cheap mortgage on, land bank, and then just leave vacant, Condos have substantial monthly fees on them. There's no way around that, no matter what interest rates drop to or how much money you have in the bank. They also generally lose relative value as they age. That means that owners want them occupied. They're a terrible investment if they're not. It's like buying a car as an investment and then just parking it on the street. It also means, yes, the new condos can seem expensive, but there usually are much cheaper options in buildings from the 70s or 80s. The older condos in a neighborhood are typically a lot less expensive than the new ones. There is no form of property that I would rather see in foreign hands than condos. Great, you wanna subsidize our infrastructure, not actually own any land and give Gary the maintenance guy a job, fine. So of course, in reality, that shit gets rented out as we find out every time that we implement a vacancy tax and then realize that fuck all of it was actually vacant because property investors are not morons. Yeah, I like money though. So I bike everywhere and I really don't enjoy riding through downtown. It doesn't feel very nice. It's not a neighborhood that works for me, but it works for some people. And maybe the biggest reason that it works for them is that it actually exists. There's a lot of talk about what sort of housing we should build the sort of neighborhoods that we should create. But in the last 20 years, this is the form of housing that has stepped up to the plate and actually supplied our cities with places for people to live. In Canada last year, over 50% of housing built was apartment style, up from around 30% in the 1990s. Much of that came in this form, and this is a pattern seen throughout the world. But high-rise developments, for some reason, create real snobs out of otherwise rational, pro-city people. The problems people have can be solved with environmental regulations or design standards that make them more pleasant to be around. Ultimately, no one is forcing you to live in them. High-rises may not create the nicest neighborhoods to you, but they have a lot going for them. And there is one thing you can say for sure. Well, actually, they are by far the highest density thing that we currently build. I'm out here with my meter roll today to do some fact checking. I've been told that the highest density neighborhoods are obviously medium density like this. Oh, that's not good, that's right behind me. <laughs> with my meter roll today, I'm looping the sentence so that I can cut it at any point with my meter roll. 
to check medium density, check neighborhood. Okay, right, let's do it. And one of them is the kind of lefty environmental, ride a bike, you know, turn the pot compost, share sexual partners, I have a beating business, you know, a bike trailer, I figured out a way to monetize chopstick recycling, community co-op, let's build a little library, uh, that sort of thing.